Hey, what's up everybody? Welcome to another episode of B is for Build. This episode, I gotta be honest, went a little bit off the rails. I showed up expecting to build one thing yesterday and I ended up spending the whole entire day doing research, learning one thing after another thing after another thing. Spent a whole nother day doing research and now we are here and I have no idea if I'm gonna build what I was gonna build, but I did learn a lot and that's what I wanna go over. So in this episode, we're gonna be talking about safety systems. We're gonna talk about seat belts. We're gonna talk about the 3.0 OEM seat belts and how they operate with and without airbags initialized, the SRS systems initialized, and we're gonna talk about racing harnesses, four points, five points, and um, five, four points and five points with anti-submarining. So, if you guys don't know what that is, it's probably good to tune in. If you're into sports cars, this is good stuff to know. If you're into rebuilding cars, this is why I'm here, is because it's about damn time that I learned this stuff already. So, I'm gonna go over it and make it as entertaining as possible, but there's a lot of good stuff in here, so stay tuned. All right, guys, so let me talk about how I got here in the first place, and then we'll kind of talk about the evolution of the things I've learned and where we got. So how I got here in the first place is the airbags are blown in the Lotus. So when the airbags are blown, they blow here, but they also blow in your OEM seatbelt if it has a pretensioner. That's the word. It's gonna, it might take me a second to think up some of the names of these things, because I've learned a lot of names of different things in the last couple of hours. Pretensioner, and I'll explain what a pretensioner is, but that is why when you get a wrecked car, the seatbelt will no longer reel in and out. It's because your pretensioner has blown, and that's on newer cars, but I mean, now newer cars is like the last 15 years, basically. So the pretensioner will normally blow if the airbags blow almost always, and then that um, makes it so your seatbelt can't go in and out. And I figured, all right, well, since I rebuilt that front crash structure, and we don't know exactly how that's gonna react, I don't have a front airbag, and I don't have plans on getting one right now, how am I gonna be the safest? Safest. So I thought I will get a harness. So I was gonna fabricate a harness bar. Harness bars have to go at the same level as the entrance level of your seat back for the, uh, the harness. So if your harness comes out like this, it needs to either come out straight or down. So it needs to be mounted at least level or down. So I was gonna build a harness bar and it's gonna go right in here. So to do that, I ordered some four point harnesses. And that's these right here. Let me hop in the seat and I'm gonna to explain to you why we're not doing that. All right, so here we are in the seat with the four point harness that I purchased. And I'll be honest, I did not do a ton of research. I wanted, I knew I wanted a four point harness because I hate having the giant circular thing that goes right here because there's five things that go into it uh, on a five point harness and you have to do them all individually. So every time you come out of the car, you unclip five things, it rests down with one of them and then you come out, every time you get back in, you have to plug in five things. I really liked that this was just a single unclip and clip. That was a selling point for me. And I thought, Sparco, Sparco makes awesome harnesses. Why not order a Sparco four point harness? Okay, these are super unsafe. Four point harnesses are legit, really, really unsafe. And here's why. It's this thing that I learned about from you guys commenting, and uh, I, you know, I didn't, I didn't choose to comment back on it, but lots of times I do read the comments almost always, and I do do research based on commenter feedback. And if I find things that are valid in comments, you know, I dig into them. So I did a lot of digging. Submarining is a really big deal. So what submarining is, is basically when your belt, you get in a wreck, and your belt hikes up or isn't already in the right spot on your body. So in the right spot on your body, you want it on that pelvic bone, and you need it to stay on that pelvic bone in the event of an accident. So, you know, they have very strict mounting rules. Uh, these, these belts, to help that, they, they mount either straight back or down 20 degrees, but level or down 20 degrees, that's the maximum. These between 60 and 80 degrees from level uh, of the seat. And that is supposed to protect you. But here's what happens in a four-point harness and how uh, they cause submarining. So submarining, what it is, is when the belt, the lap belt, sneaks off of your pelvic bone and moves its way up basically onto your gut. So you get hit really hard, you slouch and you start moving like this, and this thing stops you right here on your gut. You go flying forward, it puts immense pressure on your organs that don't have protection. I mean, fill your body, you got your rib cage right here, down here you got your pelvic bone protecting organs down here, the balls. Uh, right here you got nothing, it's goo. And all that goo stopping you is not good. It can cause internal bleeding. It can cause a lot, a lot of problems. I actually read an interview with a guy that worked at a hospital talking about the types of injuries. And he said that those can be some of the worst and they're very, very common. So 
Now this can happen in a stock three-point harness, an OEM three-point harness, and I'm gonna explain how those operate and how they try and help that not to happen. But the reason that this happens so often in a four-point harness is this. So I'm sitting here and I'm in my car and I, I applied my harness correctly. Everything's at the right angles and everything's tight. I get in an accident, I start moving, car stopping, obviously slamming into a wall or whatever. I'm gonna start moving forward. These straps, cool guy, cool guy. Um, these straps are connected to my waist belt. While I'm moving forward, these straps are gonna pull in two points. They're gonna pull the two points that they're connected, right here and on the back. Well, the back ain't moving, and that's gonna try and hike this belt up. So basically, the pressure of my shoulders moving forward is causing this belt to hike up, because that's where it's attached. That is the nature of these harnesses. So there are two ways to get around this. One is what's called a, uh, that it's, it's not having a four point harness. You get a five point or a six point and they have these things that are called the anti-submarining belts. And they basically go over the balls and they come normally down through the middle of your seat. Sometimes you see racing seats and they have a hole right there by the crotch. Well, that's because there's the fifth point of the harness runs right down through there. That stops the belt from hiking up at all. It keeps it on your pelvis keeps you nice and, nice and safe. People do say though, you don't wanna run a five point harness if you don't have a roll bar. That is because when, if the roof starts to cave in, your body can't move and get away from it because you're locked in by your shoulder belts. Um, this car has a half of a cage, so that is an option, I believe. I'm not totally sure on that, but I'm not gonna do those anyway, so let's not, let's not worry about that. That is definitely up for debate. I should say that all the stuff that I'm saying is just stuff I've read and I've learned on the internet. I'm very, I'm confident in what I'm talking and teaching you guys, but take it with a grain of salt. Ask a professional, even though I did talk to some professionals already. I called Sparko about these and I said like, what about submarining? And they're like, tough. Um, anywho, earlier I said that there are two options to, uh, for anti-submarining. One is have a five or a six point harness. Um, five will normally do it. They run like, they ran five in NASCAR until Dale Earnhardt died and then they switched to six, but there wasn't a whole lot of proof that six is even that much better than five. I, five should probably do it for you. The other one is, is there is a company, um, I can't remember the name of them, uh, that makes a, oh, another reason that not to run these if you're like me and you're rebuilding a car is these are not DOT approved seatbelts. So if you got pulled over, this is technically not a legal seatbelt to use if it's your only belt or it's just not technically legal to drive around with. So that's a bummer. Um, there's a company, something starts with an S. They make a four point harness and they, they make really good four point harnesses from what I've heard about and they have anti-submarining. The way they do that is they sew in a section on one of your arm, uh, the, yeah, one of the shoulder uh, bands and this section is basically like a quick break section and it, it's elasticated and I think it can break away and it breaks away but while staying there while the other one stays still. Apparently what that does is that allows you when you start moving forward, it allows your body to make a pivoting motion. That pivoting motion puts pressure on the pelvic area which then cinches or kind of pins your lap belt. Then when you move forward, you do your thing and you come back and they say that that is actually safer than an OEM seatbelt. That's what they say. It's like something like two hundredths of a second or something quicker tension on your pelvis um, than a OEM three-point seatbelt. So I will put a, uh, I'll put that, I put their name earlier in the video. So those are an option if I do decide to um, build a bar. I would need to build a mounting bar for a harness bar. And they also have an, uh, something that I saw on their website, which is a inertia reel uh, system that where basically if your car isn't braking and you're not under like forward momentum pressure you can kind of casually like move forward and it'll reel out a little bit of your harness but then if you go back and you slam on the brakes and it, it senses a really fast motion it'll lock your harness in also for racing it's got a switch and you can kind of flip that switch and then when you're racing it will just stay locked down the whole time so that is why you don't want to run a four-point harness like that like this that is why this four-point harness is essentially garbage. Uh, I don't know anybody at Sparkle personally, so I have no idea why they make something like this and sell it. I think it's kind of BS um, after everything that I've read that these things seem pretty dangerous. And I think it's kind of lame that they even sell something like that because honestly, it just gets a lot of people like me. And if you didn't have commenters on your own YouTube channel to tell you that those are dangerous, it'd be really hard to find out. Um, 
And a lot of times after you spend so much money on these things, you feel kind of committed and you go, oh, what are the odds that I'm gonna get in a wreck? Blah, 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 blah. Four points, no go, unless they have anti-submarining built into them, uh, which those uh, other ones that I was talking about do. So um, that's out. So I know that I either need to get the ones from that other company, um, or I need to uh, buy a five point. The reason I don't wanna buy a five point is I have had five points before. Uh, the time that it takes to get in and out of them and everything is really annoying, and I, I'd really rather not do that. So then, uh, so now it's time to move on to, uh, let's talk about OEM three point seatbelts, how they're effective, how they work, and what happens after you get in a wreck with them and how you might be able to repair them, which is gonna be fun because we're gonna have to dissect some stuff because I don't know the answer to all that. All right, so to talk about traditional three-point seatbelts, I decided to take us out here to the, uh, the old Plan A. You guys remember this car, or if you don't, this was the first car that we built on the channel. Um, so this has uh, rebuilt, if you will, or fixed seatbelts, or I don't even know if they're fixed. That's kind of why we're doing this episode. I'll explain what I'm talking about a little bit later, but let's just go over the general mechanics, and I apologize for the background noise. It's rush hour right now. But, okay, so a three-point harness, um, or seatbelt works just like this. We're going across and we're strapped in just like this. Now, how this is a lot different than a four-point harness is this. The lap belt goes across your, your pelvis, and that's how you need to be sitting in a seat if you got it on your gut. Again, that's bad, don't do that. Lap belt goes across your pelvis, and then it's connected to a pivoting point or a retraction point over here. Now, notice that there's nothing that can pull up on that belt. This thing actually, as long as it locks with the inertia reel like that, when I go down, it's actually cinching my lap belt down onto my pelvis even harder. So that is why they say three points are better than a four point if you don't have anti-submarining. Again, the same thing happens as when we we're talking about that four point and it had the quick, like kind of breakaway strap. Your body can pivot, that's okay. If your car does collapse, your body can move. There's motion, room of motion. But the main thing that I wanted to point out here is that on a three point seat belt, that the, pel the, the lap belt goes straight across your lap. There is nothing pulling up on it. There's actually something that is helping tighten it down, which is your shoulder belt. So as your shoulders do move, move forward, this tightens down. So there are two things that, that are like mechanical pieces of a, uh, a three-point belt that they don't have on a racing harness. Racing harnesses are normally, you just bolt them in, you tighten them down, they're gonna do exactly what they're doing right then. These do change a little bit. When you get in a wreck and the front of your car hits that crumple zone, it bashes in and your airbags decide, all right, we're gonna go off, this is a full-on wreck. You have what's called a pretensioner. It is controlled in your spooling section of your seatbelt. That's an explosive charge. It fires, it throws ball bearings into the wheeling part, the reeling mechanism in your seatbelt. And what that'll do is that actually tightens down your belt before your body has reacted to the accident. I think, I'm not 100% sure on that, but uh, it's tightening down your belt just a little bit to prepare your body for that accident. So I assume it's actually before, it's not gonna like try and tighten down while you're moving forward. I think it tightens down before the uh, front impact has basically affected you flying forward, at which time you do fly forward and you hit the airbag. The other thing that you have is called an inertia reel and that's, that's this thing, is when you, uh, you, you like jolt forward really fast, it hooks, it catches, and it stops you from moving forward. And it ten tensions down the, um, the lap belt and it does that. So the first thing that I talked about, the pretensioner, well that's gonna be gone in a car that's had a front impact. Like all of mine, uh, all my cars, the airbags are blown. If you blow an airbag, even if your pretensioner is uh, okay, normally they won't work. Normally if your SRS system has been uh, disengaged or has been used, none of the other airbags are gonna function. Don't quote me on that, some cars might be different. I know mine are. So. Let's move back inside and I'm gonna talk about the actual inertia reel part. Now, I don't care too much about a pretensioner. I know that a seatbelt is really good. Uh, it's probably better than a four point harness as long as the inertia reel still works. It's gonna lock up, it's gonna keep my hip in the same spot and it's gonna work well. Pretensioners are a pretty new thing and I'm not too worried about that. I, you know, older cars run without pretensioners and all that, like lots and lots of models of car leading up to them have and I still believe they're safer than a four point. So what I wanna figure out is I wanna learn a little bit more about the inertia reel. I know how to make an inertia reel reel back out by disabling the pretensioner, but what I wanna learn is how strong are these things? How are they, uh, like what, what parts are they made out of? How are they composed? Because I know on the outside it's just a couple plastic bits, but I have a feeling there's some metal under there. What I really wanna do is move us inside and figure out if this is gonna be strong enough, just this part is actually strong enough to stop you in a wreck, 
or if you need the pretensioner ball bearing explosion thing to actually be the strong thing that stops you in a wreck. I don't know which one's which and I don't, and that's what we need to learn before I decide to continue running these three point harnesses in my cars. Because honestly, if this part isn't strong enough to save you, then all I have in my cars is basically like some warm fuzzy feelings and a hope and a prayer because if this is, a, if this is not strong enough to hold my body back, then in a front, uh, front end impact, they might break and I might just go flying, which isn't good. It means I need to change up all my cars. So let's move inside. I have a seatbelt that we can take apart. Let's take it apart and figure out what's inside there. All right guys, so this is our seatbelt off of the Lotus Evora. On this side, you're looking at the inertia reel system, and on this side, you're looking at the pretensioner. And right here is the connection that goes to your SRS system, runs through. There's an explosive charge in here, and then in here is where it shoots the ball bearings into the world of craziness, which stops your uh, seatbelt from reeling. So if you look at the seatbelt, it ain't going anywhere. So the first thing I want to look at, and I've already popped the cap off of this, so I'm just going to go ahead and bring it off. This is the uh, these are the mechanics of the inertia reel system. What this is, is there's a ball bearing right here. It basically senses that your seatbelt uh, spool is level in the car, inside the car. And then if it gets inertia one way or another, it, it uh, basically flips this tiny little plastic thing into this reeling mechanism and says, all right, we're not reeling out anymore. Now, what I was talking about if I, when I was saying, I'm wondering if these are safe, is I wanna get inside this thing and I want to make sure that it's not just this tiny little 1 16th inch piece of plastic pressing up against this piece of plastic that's actually stopping the entire spool of the seatbelt. Because if my life depends on that piece of plastic not breaking, that's not an option for me. What I think is that underneath, I think that this is just a lightweight triggering mechanism for something that's underneath of here that is much stronger and it's made out of the same type of steel that this is made out of. So I think what it is is basically this starts the tensioning uh, or starts locking the tension and then it flips something underneath here that's a piece of metal that actually is hardcore and really stops it. I've seen one of these taken apart and that's how that was. I want to verify that this is the same way and then somehow put it back together correctly so we can use it in the car. Also then, as a side effect of that, we need to come over here on the other side and we need to clear out the pretensioner ball bearings from the system. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to do a tear down on this so we can see what's underneath it. All right, guys. Well, this is really good news. Uh, it is as I expected. So this is a this is a lightweight ball bearing thing that stops this piece of plastic. It's got these small fins on it. This piece of plastic, all it needs to do is it presses. Um, it it uh, there's a spring inside here. It's going to be really hard to see. I'm sorry about that. But there's a spring inside here, and that's basically holding some resistance. Then all that does is throw um, this and allows this thing to come out which actually stops the inertia reeling of the seatbelt. So it's not my life that's relying on this tiny piece of plastic affecting this piece of plastic in any more than a way that it's just saying, hey, I need you to push out right here. This pushes out and gets stuck inside these big, big uh, metal you know, grooves or cutaways, which you can clearly see. And then that stops the seatbelt from reeling out anymore. So. That is, a, that is a friggin' relief, because that means that there's something in some of my cars that are gonna stop me from flying through some of the, for, through the windshield. But, uh, okay, so with that done, I need to reassemble this piece, and then I need to get into the back of this, whoa, I probably don't wanna do that right now. I need to get into the back of this and um, take apart the, uh, the pretensioner, get the ball bearings out of the pretensioner so this thing can spool and unspool safely. And then I am going to use these on my car. I, after all the research that I've done, now this is the part where it's just my personal preference. After the research that I've done, I'm completely fine without having a pretensioner. And um, I think that they are much safer. Personally, my opinion here, not fact, don't sue me. I hope you guys don't kill yourself using my opinion, but I think that this is safer than using that Sparco four point harness because of the fact of submarining. So I'm gonna reassemble this and then we're gonna flip it over and we're gonna somehow get into the backside and take it apart.
All right, so that took me a little bit with some uh, different like little missteps because I was really uh, fussing with this thing. And what I didn't realize is that you need some of the resistance that comes from this side. You'll have one side that has a spring pack in it and you need some of that resistance from the spring pack for this ball bearing and this inertia reel system to really operate the way you would expect it in the car. I was expecting it to operate that way and it really didn't. So here's the way, when you pull the other side off, you got what we got out of it. I should probably show you that a little bit in detail. So this part has um, the ball bearings in it and they shot out this way. You can just take that, cast it aside. This part held some of the ball bearings. So we can take that, cast that aside. Because all we really need are the pieces that are essential to put this thing back together and hold its axis as well as hold its spring pack. So this spring pack is right here and then this axle is right here. This one was kind of interesting because it was riveted together. So I went down to the hardware store and I got some bolts that will uh, replace those rivets. Most of them are bolted together. So once you take this off and your spring pack is loose, here's the best way that I found to get that back um, in place is you spool the uh, seatbelt all the way up. All right, so we got our seatbelt spooled all the way up and then reattach your spring pack. This one needs to be aligned real quick. So this one has a square bracket that matches up with this one right here. There we are. And then, oh crap, hang on. I have to pull this bolt off. Okay, so now that you've got it all the way wound, when you unwind it, it will tension the spring back down. So I'm gonna go ahead and throw my bolts in here that I need to bolt in to firmly attach this uh, spring pack and everything back onto the seatbelt. All right, so now that we have our spring pack in, when we feed, uh, feed seatbelt out, it will basically coil that spring up and want to uh, bring it back in. And on our other side, we have our inertia reel all in here and we need the cap on here. But so what we're gonna see is when you hold the seatbelt, um, this unit, the spooling unit, straight up and down and like it would be on the car and level, you're gonna be able to feed seatbelt out. If you move it to the side just slightly, it's gonna lock. But if you hold it straight up and down, it will feed out and then the, uh, the, charge, uh, the spring pack is gonna bring it back in. So this is one down, this is one done. So I can take my little cap here and throw it on. So what I wanna do now is I'm gonna go ahead and grab the other one that we had on this car and I will bring it over here and just do the, not do the exploring part that led us to taking this part off, but just do the other part and I'll get it done real quick uh, as a little like kind of second glance for you guys to see how to do this one more time. There we have our second one done. Uh, I, I did get a little bit stumbled up. I accidentally kind of messed up the spring pack in here. I had to take it back off once I, I reeled it out and realized it wasn't um, it wasn't kind of springing back in. So I took it back apart, fixed that little spring pack, and uh, we're good. So keep it up and down level. It's coming out. Uh, move it to the side. It's not going anywhere. And if we jerk it really fast, it's locking up. So there we go. Two seat belts fixed. All right guys, well that was my breakdown on what I learned about seat belts and harnesses and safety and the, the safety between four point harnesses, five point harnesses and your stock three point harnesses and what you can do with the three point stock seat belt after it's been wrecked. That's what I've done on all my cars but I've never really dug it down into a level of depth to make sure that it was really strong enough which is negligent of me, I admit, but now we know or now I know and I, I've seen that mechanism and I'm confident that that would hold in the event of an accident. Again, this is all just my opinion on these things. Uh, you, know, can, you guys should consult with other people if you want. I would say though, you know, there's gonna be a lot of comments. Why don't you fix your airbag, blah, 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 blah. With, with this build and with all the builds that I do, I really like to get the car running in driving shape in a somewhat safe fashion and use it for a little bit, be it two months, six months, a year, whatever, and figure out if I really enjoy the car and if I'm really gonna continue using it before I go all out and have all the airbags reset and have everything done. This car, it is particularly hard to get these airbags for. As we know, like Lotus parts can be really hard to get. I already have looked into airbags. There aren't any secondhand that I can find and that's one of the big decisions for I'm going uh, one of the big reasons why I'm going this direction is because it is hard to get parts for this car. 
in the future, you know, after I get this car on the road, if I'm enjoying it in the future, I'd be looking at, I'll keep my eye out for a used front subframe and airbag modules. Uh, you need an airbag computer, you need a passenger airbag, you need a driver airbag, and I'll need both those side things for the seatbelts. But they do often sell these in kits. You can buy a whole kit that you can just plug into your car. So you guys, if you're trying to be as safe as possible, either take it to a professional or buy the entire kit and replace it yourself. Once you see that little airbag light go off, you can run some more diagnostics, but you're probably gonna be pretty safe. Uh, in my case, I'm just doing this because it's budget. It's gonna get me on the road. It's gonna get me behind the wheel of this car, testing it in a re relatively safe manner. And then, you know, if I fall in love with it, which I'm expecting to, and I'm daily driving it all the time, I'll keep my eye out. I'll get myself a new subframe so we don't have the uh, repairs that I did on that. And I'll get myself a, a new airbag, a new set of airbags and airbag control modules and all that good stuff. Um, but if you guys are on a budget, that is a way to do it. And that's the way that I do it on my salvage cars. All right, I hope you enjoyed watching this episode of BS for Build. If you like BS for Build and you like what we do, head over to bsforbuild.com, scroll down to the shop. You can pick up a shirt, a key tag, hats, grabbing anything from the shop. All the proceeds of that go directly to this build and the future builds. So thank you guys very much for supporting us that way. You can find us on social media at bsforbuild.com, facebook.com slash bsforbuild, and we are bsforbuild on Instagram. Thank you guys so much. For watching if you're watching this up to date this weekend we are not going to have an episode like we normally do i got some important stuff to go visit family for but we will pick right back up with some more fun stuff we're jumping into the bodywork section of this car in the next episode and that should be really fun and i think i even get to paint stuff so it's going to be exciting for me at least so thank you guys very much for watching please remember to like and subscribe peace come, come.